rather than slant it to a particular agenda or anything, right. I think we'll uh, we'll just try to cover it, you know, and just try to get, I mean, and just try to get reality here, and then, uh, you know, and then go home and see what we end I, up getting. You know, I think it's silly to try to jam a trip like this into any agenda. I mean, th th these people dictate their own agenda. Yeah. And uh, the agenda is that uh, um, these people remind these people remind us that this canyon and its experiences transcends all of the bureaucratic hoopla that we have put ourselves through in the last 10 years and uh, you I mean you know that as well I mean I, I think that's been the that's been the most one of the things that I've gotten out of this trip already is to be reminded that there is something much more to the experience of the river and Grand Canyon than how the dam is operated, what governmental agency controls the dam management, what governmental agency controls scientific research down here, um, who's involved, who's not. Uh, to get people back down here from the 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s when they were just down here having a good time and truly having adventures um, is we, we need to have more of these people down here <laughs> reminding us what's really important that's for sure and what is really important what's for this river and its management yeah Well, it'll be just to kind of expand on what I what I said earlier. I I think that um, we've taken ourselves on a long journey for the last um, fifteen years on river management. Um, that journey started. 15 years ago with the proposals by the Bureau of Reclamation to operate and rewind the turbines and move this system to 40,000 CFS high discharges and much lower discharges. And um, the journey since then has taken us on this roller coaster of activism by the environmental community activism by the outfitters, a negotiated settlement to substitute science for, in, substitute scientific studies as a sort of buy-off instead of agreeing to make some fundamental management changes 10 years ago. 10 years ago or 12 years ago, um, what went on here is what goes on in so many places in the world. Instead of making a tough decision right then, you say, well, let's pay to have some studies done, and we'll see what those studies say, and then we'll make the decision 10 years from now, and certainly we'll make better decisions in the future than we would have 10 years ago, but it also allowed people to delay making tough decisions for 10 years. Um, Ten years ago when I started working in Grand Canyon, I encountered tremendous cynicism on the part of the River Guides community. Um, I would say most of it justified, but the bottom line is substantial cynicism ten years ago that any of this research in Grand Canyon would mean or amount to anything. Um, that this, wa this was in fact nothing more than a grand way to dump a whole bunch of money to buy off some scientists and that the Bureau would just go on and do what it always had done and the River Guides community down here 
felt very powerless to change it. I rare I probably never encountered a guide who said to me in 1984, we're going to change things. We're going to make the Bureau of Reclamation change how they operate the dam. Instead, what guide said to me was, the Bureau always does whatever it wants to. And heaven knows what your research is going to show, because the Bureau will always do whatever it wants to. Um, I think in the last 10 years, we've been on this ever ascending um, um, scale of escalating scientific research, escalating money spent, escalating number of trips launched, um, escalating number of raw pe just raw numbers of people who work down here. Um, somewhere in the midst of that, um, as the scientific work was just ascending, the river community and the river guides and the general environmental public finally began to see that there was a hope of things changing. And um, in some sense, divorced from the, uh, almost divorced from the scientific effort, the public participation program began to bear fruit and culminated in the Grand Canyon Protection Act. And I think what we have here in 1994 is sometimes what I would say is two different tracks. A tract of uh, continuing scientific research. And there are great differences of opinion about the appropriateness and the, about the scale of the effort of scientific research. And then, um, much more citizen concern now. Every guide, or I think many guides and many people who come down here now really believe that their opinions do matter. And so I think that the first thing to observe when you say, well, what matters down here is that what matters down here is are the opinions of the people who find this a special place. Um, I, bel I try as hard as I can in my own work to, 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 to try to separate or try to keep clear that part of me which is a scientist, data collector, conceiver of research ideas implementer of those research ideas and then interpreter of those data to um, pr produce new insights into how the river system works. But I would be naive to think, to, for me, I would, uh, I, that's not all that I am and that's not all of the opinions that I hold down here. I've got another set, which is what are the values that I have because, and what are the values that I hold about this river corridor? And um, I have to work as hard as I can to separate those because I can't let those values uh, get in the way of interpreting the data. There are many times that I've had to say over time that I'm that I was wrong, opinions that I expressed in the past were wrong. Um, but there are values that I have, and I, I dare say that it's very hard for any scientist to spend a lot of time in Grand Canyon without developing a fundamental love for this place. And, um, and so I have my own values of what I think are important. Um, but I think that the most important one is the most general, and that's that no governmental agency and no set of scientists 
ought to be the ones who establish what the values for this place are. Our job as scientists and agency people is to lay the decisions out before the public, including the river, gui river guides and the um, river passengers and visitors, and then it's all of us together as citizens of the United States who have to make the important value, value decisions for this, for this corridor. Um, I personally dream of a river system that functions as much like the river system that these people on this trip tell us was the river of old. Um, I know and I have to accept that as someone who is alive in the 1990s that the world has changed that I was not even alive at the times that many of these people traveled through here. I didn't know that Grand Canyon existed then. But one can't read all the old journals and look at all the old photographs and listen to the stories and not be moved by uh, the descriptions of the way this river looked and functioned in the old. And um, I think we need to establish as our standard against our, our standard of um, our standard of judging what kinds of changes at Glen Canyon Dam are appropriate or not. We need to establish as our benchmark the way the world was down here before the dam was built. The way the world was down here, let's say between 1945 and 1955. And um, we surely cannot have that river back, but when we think about how this river has changed from then to now, and now we move for the future from now to something else, um, we need to judge it against the old, in my view, we need to judge it against the old standard. And we need to uh, start, we, we, need to, we need to keep that as our goal and um, to me, that's the value of, of a place as a place as special as Grand Canyon, and every one of these people here has been tremendously moved for the rest of their lives by the chance they had to come through Grand Canyon just a few times. None of these people came through 200 times the way a modern senior level re, uh, river guide might go through. These are people who only went through Grand Canyon one, two, five seven times in their life and yet their lives were fundamentally changed because of that and um, so this place has a power and you don't need hundreds of trips to gain that sense of power um, but I think the value uh, the, the, the values are to return this river as much as we can to the old ways um. For the record, <coughs> for the oral history and stuff, I should get you to give us a brief, give us a resume, kind of a rundown of how, you, who you are and what you do, and even your name and stuff, and what you do and how, how you arrived on this. And what you've done. Um, my name is Jack Schmidt. Presently, I am on the faculty at Utah State University. I. Um, teach in the Department of Geography and Earth Resources and in the Watershed Science Program. Um, I did my first research trip in Grand Canyon 
in May of 1984, um, which is a little over 10 years ago. Um, in the way I arrived down here um, was that I knew Grand Canyon because I'd been a recreational river runner before that had been lucky enough to travel through Grand Canyon in 1981 uh, on what will always be in my memory one of the great experiences of my life. It's a uh, first time through Grand Canyon is not like any other and we barely knew what we were doing and we scouted every damn rapid on the river and every time we went around to Bend, we had no idea what was going to be downstream and we had no idea what any rapid looked like and uh, um, there's no trip like that one. What were the circumstances of that trip? That was just a private party. That was just a private party trip. I'd entered the lottery and we drew our number and it was a group of close friends uh, from Montana and California and uh, we ended that trip far closer, friends, than we started. It was uh, it was uh, as wonderful experience as I could remember, and uh, it really was a truly wonderful experience. And um, I had subsequently decided to return to school for my PhD. I uh, at the time was running a consulting business in Helena, Montana, and uh, so I'd returned to get a a PhD in my early 30s and uh, was pursuing a different research project in in the Montana was at the geological survey offices in Denver talking to some colleagues about what they thought about the idea to work this particular project I wanted to do and at the end of a whole day of conversation I said to someone well those are my ideas about what to work. Do you have any ideas? I mean, are there any other research programs going on in the United, you know, some, something else that I might not know about that might be a good thing to hook into? And uh, a friend of mine uh, with the geological survey said, well, we're just starting to gear up and doing research in Grand Canyon. Um, and they could use some help down there. If you wanted, if you thought you wanted to work in Grand Canyon, um, we might be able to get you involved. And I barely needed time to file away that research proposal, whatever it was, and never look at it again, and start working in Grand Canyon. And uh, I showed up from. Uh, I got off a plane and. Um, in Phoenix in May of 84, got in a car with a geological survey person, drove up to Lee's Ferry, um, got on a trip. Um, that was a trip that launched in May. It was one of the first trips outfitted by Humphrey Summit. It um, was... Uh, one of the first and only inter multidisciplinary research trips ever launched and never would be launched again. It was a trip that involved several people from Arizona Game and Fish, Brian Brown and the bird survey team, uh, and then Julie Graff from the USGS and I. We had a motor rig, um, Dan Durker rowing a uh, oar boat, and we were all spread out, but we all had to move at kind of a pace established by whoever knew. No, that's not a problem. With this stuff, it's just a matter of, I mean, you just, it's just a matter of getting this mixer You rolling again, Jeff? I am rolling now. Uh, just one, hu just, um, just two humorous anti- uh, notes about that trip. The uh, one was the fact that all the the the, the fish, the or all, all the fo folks from Arizona Game and Fish, they were working in tributaries, and um, 
So their last work was in Havasu Creek. So they were completely finished working at Havasu Creek, but the bird work needed to go on downstream. So in May of 84, we spent, I think, seven or eight days below Lava Falls with two thirds of the people on the trip having nothing to do. And uh, the uh, temperature reached, I think we clocked 113 in the shade one day at Parashant and uh, um, uh, that was one of the reasons those trips never happened again. I also remember sitting below Lava Falls for a day in the hot sun with all the loaves of bread and um, <clears throat> Tom Moody organized us all to uh, go through every loaf of bread slice by slice and punch out the green mold out of all the bread because all the bread had turned moldy. We didn't have any bread that wasn't moldy and rather than throw it all away, we sat and took it out slice by slice and punched out all the mold. So that was a pretty classy outfitting experience. That was something for everybody to do while they yes. do all. Right. Meanwhile, Brian was off looking at birds. Um, Anyway, that was the trip, and um, to show you how, how things have evolved over time, you might remember in 1984 that the original reason for environmental research in Grand Canyon was to study the incremental environmental impact of changing the peaking power operations from a high of 31,500 cubic feet per second to a high of 33,500 cubic feet per second. That that was what the original mission of the Glen Canyon Environmental Studies was just to study that small change. Um, and so we launched on this river trip. Of course, we launched on this river trip and the river was flowing at 45,000 cubic feet per second in May of 1984 because we were in a bypass spill situation and a year earlier the river had been up above 90,000 cubic feet per second. And I remember standing on the bank, I, I was down here looking for a research project. I didn't know what to work on. And um, I remember saying to this person I was traveling with, well, it seems to me that we really ought to be initiating some studies on what these high flows would do are doing to this river system and um, what's going on with sediment being transported by the river and what's going on with the eddies because here we have a river that's unusually flooding and this person I was traveling with just dressed me down and told me that under absolutely no circumstances was I to spend any time working on research related to the river at these discharges um, that in fact um, the only job of the geological survey was to study the effect of an incremental change in power plant operations and that we I was not to do anything other than that and that that really shows you the evolution of where we came from and where we are now, just in terms of the, of the, of the GCES-related studies. Um, the next trip I did was in the summer of 84, and I had no funding support. And so I just launched my own trip. Uh, my in-laws gave me a little money to, to stay alive, and... Uh, we uh, borrowed a boat from uh, uh, Brian Durker and Tom Moody, and, and I rode a, a one boat down, and then we had an old snout that we borrowed from a friend that was completely overloaded. And uh, we barely, we didn't have, we hadn't bought enough food, so we, we, we did a 21-day trip without any leftovers. We scraped the pots every night. We all lost weight during the trip. Um, and it was all high adventure because we were all kind of barely skilled enough to get through. We, we got through, but the river is a forgiving, uh, force. And, um, I still basically hadn't the slightest idea what I was doing down here. I was still trying to figure out what the questions were. 
and then if you don't know what the question is, you can't figure out how to answer it. But I thought I'd be working on sandbars, and um, uh, went did another trip later that year um, with Tim Whitney on a on a bed riverbed sampling trip, and then went back to Johns Hopkins, wrote a research proposal. It was funded through GCES and I moved to Tucson in March of 1985 and um, uh, launched my own research trip in, Mar in May of 85. And again, um, at that time what I was going to study was how the sandbars had changed and what caused them to change and why the pattern of change seemed to be erratic because there had been a publication uh, out in that same year which basically contended that the net result of the high floods had been that some went up, some bars eroded and some bars degraded and that uh, the, the pattern was kind of haphazard and, and I was skeptical that the pattern was haphazard and that all you could do was throw your hands in the air and say some sandbars go up and say some sandbars go down. Um, so I was going to go out to all the profile lines, the topographic surveys that had been established by Alan Howard and Bob Dolan in the 1970s, and that Stan Buse at the time was repeating, and I was going to do detailed geological and river pattern, river flow studies at those sites to see what was the same and different about each one of those sites. So I went up to Lee's Ferry, I was training some people how to survey, we were going to do excavations, and 24 hours before I launched, somebody came up to me in the Marble Canyon Cafe and said, oh, by the way, the river discharge tomorrow is going to be increased from 25,000 CFS to 48,000 CFS. And um, so I launched on my first trip that I was going to do on my own, <coughs> with essentially no notice that every study site I was going to work on was about to go underwater. And everything that I was going to do on that trip was right out the window. So I had to instantly sort of think through, now what do I do? What's, what's the plan? Which included just packing the pickups up and driving away and saying, well, I guess there's nothing to do in Grand Canyon. But that certainly isn't very much fun in that uh, uh, Clearly, you can't put your tail between your legs and give up. But I had to kind of think through it. I didn't have all the gear that I needed to. Um, but I pushed off down the river and collected data on velocity and river flow characteristics at critical sandbars when they were underwater. Um, to this day, the data that I collected on that one trip is probably the most valuable set of data that I've ever collected. Um, all it was was on-air photos mapping where the edges of the flow were and where the eddies were, but everything kind of sunk in by the end of that trip. The patterns of why sandbars are where they are in relationship to the eddy flow patterns, um, just how low velocity the depositional settings are of sandbars, even though the river can be roaring downstream out in the main channel. Um, and I did all that with basically no notice and using movie cameras and throwing oranges and grapefruits into the river to kind of get the flow patterns and get velocities of floating objects. And, um, and I'm continually forced to remember now what the river was like then. Because if we have an experimental flood next spring, it'll basically look like what we had 10 years ago. Um, Still at that time in 85, it was a controversial issue about whether or not to study the effect of floods on this river system. Despite the fact that we were having floods every year. Every time we'd go off to a bureaucratic meeting, we would argue about this stuff. And the Bureau of Reclamation was trying very hard to keep floods from being seriously studied and the geological survey was generally um, unwilling to challenge the Bureau because all of the geological survey's money came from the Bureau. And so the basic 
idea was don't do anything to piss off the client. Um, you can do other things quietly, but just don't let them know about it. Um, well, we pushed on with our studies and, and uh, along my own thinking has evolved over time and one of the one of the big conclusions of the phase one GCES was that a succession of big clear water floods was dangerous and harmful to the beaches um, and my own work reiterated and supported earlier conclusions of Nancy Bryan and John Thomas who had found that, that campsites had largely eroded in the upper end of the canyon and largely we had more campsites below Kanab Creek, but that was kind of a so what, that's not where we need them. And, and my, my work supported, supported those conclusions. Um, so I came out very strongly against floods because of those patterns, but I was wrong in the details of what I said because I was not careful to distinguish the sort of long duration clear water floods back to back to back to back years that we had in the 80s. Um, um, that equated, when I used the word floods, I just used it generally. And what I really needed to have said was that those kind of high floods that occurred too often for too long at too high a discharge were destined to strip sand out of this canyon. Um, well, anyway, that's how I got started. And out of that came a dissertation and, and some research papers. and. Uh, uh, employment with the geological survey didn't work out and I went off and uh, taught at a small college in Vermont and um, but I couldn't give up on I cared too much about all this and I was far too sort of personally involved in in caring about how this river was managed um, to give up my research program um, no one in GCES or, or the Park Service or anywhere else would give me any money to support my research. And so for a couple years, I needed to, um, I came out here on research trips, uh, essentially funded by the tuition dollars of students at Middlebury College, because I, I would uh, talk them into doing a winter uh, mid uh, or intercession uh, research trip in Grand Canyon. And so in January of 1989 and January 1990, I did January, uh, well, I did these winter trips at which we surveyed camp campsites and, and uh, I did it without any funding support. Why wouldn't those guys, why wouldn't the Bureau or GCS fund you, do you think? Uh, don't want to get into that. That's okay. Um, yeah, I'm not mm -hmm. gonna. Um, the, um, we don't have to dwell. On yeah, that. I. Um, but I couldn't get funding, and um, one of the interesting things at that time was that I. Uh, I actually went to the Park Service and said, gee whiz, here I am, I'm willing to run your trips for free, why don't you just give me a few thousand bucks to kind of cover the general logistical support or, or let me use your equipment or can't you supply a Park Service boats and, and uh, wouldn't you want some sort of independent interpretation of what's going on that you can get some independent insight in relationship to all of this work being done by the Bureau of Reclamation. And um, uh, Park Service wasn't the least bit interested. 
Park Service said there's only, at that time, said there's only one entity who does research in Grand Canyon, and that's Glen Canyon Environmental Studies. And since I couldn't get any money f or cooperation from them, um, uh, it was uh, it was a done deal. I could certainly get research permits. I mean, they would they did allow me a river research permit, but uh, that's kind of how things went for a couple of years. And um, what I did to keep myself on the radar screen for a couple of years was work as hard as I could to get um, scientific research papers out. And um, eventually, uh, there was a meeting held, uh, a conference convened by the National Academy of Sciences in Santa Fe in the early 90s about what Grand Canyon research was all about. <coughs> and um, at that point, I just was one of the few people who had actually published any research. and. Um, uh, that kind of broke a certain log jam that it was a bit unusual that I wouldn't be getting any support if I'd at least generated some research results. And, uh, and then I began to eke my way back in um, with, uh, and then in one, yeah, I can't remember what year, but uh, Duncan Patton, the, senior scientist for the Glen Canyon Environmental Studies asked me to work with him as um, and, and provide him advice, uh, technical ad advice on sediment and geomorphology research studies. And, and uh, ever since then, I have served in that capacity as essentially a research advisor to Duncan on sediment and research issues. and, and uh, and then I've become a bit more involved since then. So that's sort of a 10-year history. Uh, I, I think that what's important in all that is that, um, again, the, the perspective on what the big questions are here have moved dramatically in 10 years. Um, we've moved dramatically from the fact that we were only looking at power plant operations to now we're looking at whole river management. Um, we have had tremendous fights about um, the role of floods, whether floods were something we were going to consider in the whole operating scheme. And um, there have been those, several of us in the scientific community who have argued for selected events of flooding to restore the river corridor and those who have fought tenaciously against it. And, um, uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of how far we've moved in 10 years.